Good morning to you all. Um, I'm not going to introduce you individually. So when, when I come to talk to you, uh, can you introduce yourself as well? That would be really helpful. It's partly because of uh, my pronunciations of your names might not be quite right. Um, COVID-19 has really highlighted for me um, some of the fault lines in our society and the, the way the systems that we run our lives. And this, is, of course, is exactly what artists do, or, or a lot of the best artists show the ways, uh, uh, our ways of thinking show the faults and the joys in the way we think. Um, but our sort of more traditional leaders, I think, have been very much uh, caught in the, the proverbial car headlights, the rabbits in the headlights. And um, earlier today on, in this conference, there was a, a discussion about um, short-termism and the balance between short-termism and long-termism. And I think this is one thing that the media really have not got this balance right. Um, one of our panelists later, Joellen Hoang, is, um, who is uh, the founder of SUI, a, a female entrepreneur organization. She's going to talk of fear as being the overriding dominant uh, feeling for this period. And... Now I'm going to open my screen to share an image that an art, artist made back in 2008, an Estonian artist. And I think this, this shows how we, um, we're, we're all involved in, um, we're all involved in this process. It's not just the, our leaders that are, are the problem. We are feeding them. This, this work by an, an Estonian artist called Timo Toots. If you come into the room, normally that his work, Media Bubble 2008, is, you'll just see a little dot on the, on the floor, nothing else. And then when you activate it, when you get onto it, suddenly things start in. I saw it originally in Russia, and the information that came out was supplied by Pravda. So all the information came out. Now, if you started dancing, the whole room was lit up. Information about uh, those how much we, we have um, been feeding the media, how much our fear feeds it. Um, a, few months, a few months before the epi epidemic struck, another panellist, um, Neil Lawson May, read me a passage um, from Dominic, blog, uh, Dominic Cummings' blog. Um, after his role in Brexit, um, Neil's, uh, my favourite man, wasn't exactly Dominic Cummings. But in his blog, blog, he wrote a very interesting comment. So Cummings wrote a very interesting comment that I've heard from some of the most important scientists involved in the creation of advanced technologies, is that artists see things first. That is, artists glimpse possibilities before most technologies and long before most businessmen and politicians. This is a clever way of putting it. Artists are not usually leaders, they're more observers, but we all learn from their ideas. Um, partly as a, a fault of the, our overprotective art market, I think business leaders and artists are not in, in as much 
direct contact. Um, artists are treated as brands and commodities. And so there is not enough interaction between the ideas of artists and business leaders. We're basically not using our leaders, our, our artists enough. Uh, now, my first question uh, is, is going to go to Carla Rigi uh, in San Francisco. So thank you very much for staying up so late. And um, she works with musicians, musical artists. And you started your business, Bangini, just before COVID-19, I believe. So I thought it would be interesting if you could tell us, walk, walk us through that process, how it's been, just starting a business, trying to network, promote artists uh, together. Uh, so Carla, over to you. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really glad to join this panel. Yeah, um, Band Genie is the company that I founded, and we are a network for independent musicians. Our goal is to really unify local live music communities everywhere. Um, we are based in the United States, but open to anywhere, anyone around the globe. Um, originally, the premise for the platform was to help communities really get in touch with their local live music culture. Um, you know, you talked about uh, artists being thought of as commodities. And I think some of the challenge is that our, our music labels and whatnot tend to latch on to what sells and then seek out more of the same. And it can be really difficult to appreciate the diversity uh, of music cultures locally that really do reflect what's happening uh, at the hyperlocal scale that's relevant to communities. And um, so that was the premise. It was really all about li live music events in small independent businesses, music venues, restaurants, bars, et cetera. And I was working on this and then COVID hit. And I realized that the original idea of building this a uh, geocentric mobile app really wasn't viable anymore because all the venues closed, all the musicians were out of work. Everybody was scrambling to stay alive, really, to put food on the table, to pay their rent. Um, and, and so I had to pivot very quickly. And it was actually in March, it was right when the lockdown started here in San Francisco, that I decided to launch a web community instead. Uh, you can think of it like a LinkedIn for local live music. Um, and we also embraced the live streaming culture, um, as did all independent artists really quickly. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you said that artists aren't normally thought of as leaders, but um, they are very, very flexible, very adaptable, um, very open to experimenting with any new technology and embracing any way that they can continue to do what they love, continue to get the message out there. And I think the great thing about artists is that they are thought leaders in some ways, and they also lead us on a journey of exploring or, or taking another look at what's happening around us. Um, and the musicians are not just commenting on you know, their personal emotions, although obviously that's part of it, but they're really reflecting on what's happening in society. And here in the US, we have a perfect storm happening because not only was COVID threatening our uh, literally our lives, um, but also our economic well-being. And at the same time, there's political turmoil. At the same time, there's racial injustice. And so you're seeing a lot of these themes come out very, very prominently in the work of artists at all levels. Um, and I think that live streaming this technology and, and their willingness to embrace that has really helped uh, foster the conversation and bring, bring people together around topics that matter. Thank you. I, I think it was, it's particularly interesting. You, I, I, I agree musicians and songwriters are in a slightly different uh, position. Often they become sort of campaign leaders and focus points for, for information, which is, is, is fascinating. Um, but I wonder whether you might be able to give some sort of specific uh, examples of things, of artists, artists and um, dancers and performers that have done things that have, have got people together. For instance, uh, over here in Europe, um, I read of an extraordinary ballet dancer who was feeling so frustrated uh, 
locked up in Barcelona, uh, that he realised the only time, his only moment of freedom was when he was putting out the rubbish. So he dev- designed a chore- choreography around uh, around the the dance, and everybody watched him in the street. But have you got examples that you can? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's so many different ways that artists are are reaching out and trying to build community and connect with the people around them, eat despite the social distancing that's mandated. Um, some of them are actually booking sidewalk shows. Um, then they're perfectly compliant and they'll, uh, somebody will hire them to come and play on the sidewalk for the community. So that's great. Um, others have traveling vans or trucks um, and it really does help to bring people together even if you just have to sit on your porch. Um, in New Orleans, a lot of people were doing porch concerts um, from the balconies that are so familiar, right? From, you know, you think of Bourbon Street, you think of the, the balconies and whatnot, but going back to technology, in interesting... That, that, Thank you. I, I, you're breaking up a bit, so I oh, think I, I better, I'll come back to you because I would love to. I think you told me before about some amazing breakdowns, dances, and things like that that you were involved with. But uh, I, I'll now jump to uh, Neil, if I may, and we'll come back back to you, Carla, if that's okay. Um, Neil actually uh, has um, has a um, commissioned a composer as well as Carla, so um, in your area. But when he did so, he made um, most of his male friends very jealous because he commissioned uh, um, Howard Kendall to write a piece called For, for Tracy uh, for his wife's birth, birthday, and most of his male friends couldn't keep up with this uh, competition. But I'm not going to talk about music with you, Neil, I'm wanting to ask really about your uh, adventure in Birmingham and Aston, um, where you have um, uh, are building a sculpture park uh, in in conjunction with the university. And I would love you to explain how this came about. What gave you the idea? Morning, Alistair. Morning, everyone. I uh, hope you're all well. Um, uh, well, first of all, I, to, to say that I'm building a sculpture park is, um, I think, overdoing my role. Um, it, it's it's a whole group of people who are who are trying to build a sculpture park. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Birmingham, uh, it's Britain's second city, but it's um, at least in art terms, um, a, a slightly perhaps sad is, is not is not quite the word, but it's the word I'm going to use. Uh, place in that most of the public art in Birmingham is of a very traditional sort. It's it's sculptures of Queen Victoria, as it might be, or or other people who in in the past have been the the, the great and good. But it doesn't have um, uh, a, a lot of modern or contemporary uh, public art. And as it happens, the uh, campus of Aston University is right in the centre of the city. Um, and it is unusually green. It has a lot of green space. It has a lake. Um, it has performance space. Um, and it has uh, a, a lot of pu- public access. And uh, unusually for a university, I mean, universities are mostly uh, closed spaces where really only the students and the faculty um, get get to use the, the area. Because it's right in the centre of the city, um, this particular campus is used by the public as well. So uh, local uh, workers come and eat their lunch in the campus. Uh, people walk through it on their way to and from work and so forth. And it happens to be at the end of the uh, new um, high-speed train line, HS2. So the terminus is, is absolutely adjacent to the, to the campus. So this is a strategic location. And um, I wanted to bring art to the city. And I thought that we could do something with the university. Um, that would be uh, interesting uh, and exciting. And so we're trying to find some spaces on the campus where we can put uh, contemporary art. Uh, and that's really 
um, uh, what we're trying to do. And it's, it's for the benefit of the students, it's for the benefit of the faculty, but it's for the benefit of the city uh, as well. For, uh, for the purposes of this uh, discussion, um, you are working with a group of artists called the Rax Media Collective, who in one way are some of the leaders, pioneers in transformation of ideas. They're, they're always involved in transferring one system of ideas to another and comparing what's going on. And um, would you be, I'm going to, while you're talking, I am going to show on the screen one of Rax's most famous works, which is one of their clocks, which is not the work that it will be with you in uh, Birmingham, but it's linked to it. Um, would you like to talk about that? Uh, sure, yes. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, Rax a Media Collective is a group of three individuals who are probably three of the um, smartest people on the planet. It's absolutely terrifying talking to them. Um, you, you really you really can't keep up. Um, and uh, a lot of what they have to say is about um, time and it's about connectivity between uh, people and it's about how, how we have shrunk the world through things like the internet and email and, and, and so forth. And you'll see from this uh, illustration you've put up uh, that here they've, they've kind of combined both of those ideas, um, this is a clock, so it's absolutely conventional, it's analog, uh, we're all familiar with this, but instead of uh, numerals around, around the dial, they've put emotions, and if you look, these emotions are a mixture of um, what we might broadly call positive uh, and negative, and they're all the emotions that, that we would feel um, most days or most weeks, most months, um, and they've used a lot of these clocks, and the emotions are always different. They usually um, display the emotions in conjunction with the, with the client, so it's some kind of a process where they, they work out what those emotions should be. Um, in the case of Aston, there is an existing very, very large clock on the campus, very prominent. You can see it from the city centre. And we had the idea of converting this clock, which just simply has hands and, and a couple of... Uh, uh, notches to show time uh, into a, a rack style emotional clock and that has um, interestingly excited a lot of uh, positive and negative comment because we have on campus a culture where um, it's difficult to expose people to negative emotions and by definition this clock has negative emotions and there are two camps here one camp says um, we don't want students to be faced every day with uh, uh, aspects of the world which are negative. And the other says um, it's good for people to see that everyone feels the same concerns and fears and everyone has the same uh, positive uh, emotions um, as well. Um, and we haven't resolved that yet. So whether this clock gets installed or not, I, I'm, I'm not yet sure. That's, that's great. Um... That, uh, that's a very interesting story. A, a similar situation happened to me when I was working with Deutsche Bank, um, and exactly that. And often it's the people who resist works of art, actually when they're, they take ownership of them, when they're on their campus or when they're in their working area. Now, um, Zuallen, um I was hoping um, as you uh, work for... Uh, an organization promoting women entrepreneurs, you might be able to talk a little bit about how women entrepreneurs have faced the pandemic in, and any um, stories and visions like that that might help us. You have to unmute, sorry. Hello. Please introduce yourself properly. So with your proper pronunciation, that would be nice. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. First of all, I would like to give my thanks to the founder of the conference, Mr. Frank, and my mentor, uh, Jamie Chen, the, the founder of Cosmic Citizen, for inviting me to this conference. 
I also want to thank Daddy Hot, Mr. Alistair Hicks, for your unselfish help and thanks for technology. Yes, we already missed the physical conference, but we really meet and chat with each other right now. So I'm very pleased for the, everything, all of this. Yes, I will introduce myself. I'm Wu Ling Huang. I'm the chairperson of Tsuhui. I'm from China. Yes, Tsuhui is a winning and nervous organization of Pencil Sister Asia. My organization has women to increase self value and accelerate self working and also establish the Pencil Sister Asia Women and Nurse Association and has established international trade and investment guidelines. I have been also been invited by a UN NGO, Young Global Leadership Foundation, as an internet intergenerational global commerce member. Yes, actually, I also have the Bachelor of Art. After receiving a bachelor's degree in public art management, I shifted my research focused to the field of art and business integration and my master's degree in management. So, yeah, you ask me the story about the women entrepreneurs in China. Actually, I think in China, the entrepreneurs has, actually, in China, the epidemic has almost disappeared and we can live as before. But uh, about five months ago, it's totally different. Uh, during the so isolation, Everyone expects to get what they need through the internet, uh, both the financial and emotion. And uh, the break outbreak has led to tens of thousands of strangers rapidly build online relationships. Um, I think although, although the epidemic has affected Chinese ec economy, many Chinese women entrepreneurs have seized the opportunity. For example, online education, online video, online shopping, even, even the internet games. So, in fact, the in epidemic has brought strangers together and made many women entrepreneurs richer. I will give uh, you another one uh, uh, example. Weishang, Weishang is very popular in China. Uh, this is a new e-commerce platforms have been built a best on personal WeChat accounts. This new social media are helping people learn, shop, chat, play games, and even get emotion comfort. So uh, in one sense, the status of women entrepreneurs is improving through the digital connection. Yes, uh, and um, yes, Mr. Mr. Alistair Hicks. Yeah, yeah, I, I know you know Tofu from the articles you wrote in the Financial Times, right? Yeah, I, can I, yes, I, I was just about to say something about that because what you're talking about is very much, yes. um, very much what Sao Fei, uh, a Chinese woman artist, um, was talking about right right back ten years before the the yeah. pandemic, in rather the same sort of time as the work that I was showing by Timo Toots, and she created one of the great works on the internet. Yes, uh, RMB City, and uh, yes. I, in a way, she was blurring the ba boundaries between the sexuality and the in a fluid way. Back then, by showing that you could choose your own, uh, your own avatar, your own avatar, your own creation, and so you creating your own identity, which is another side of you, and um, that that was, um, I think, she was one of the great, great pioneers in, in it, using the internet. The interesting thing, though, is how quickly everything dates. Uh, so I was showing her work in a Turkish museum um, two years ago, and already the technology to support it was outdated. So 
And the whole thing is about engagement and uh, social engagement. It was in, in uh, so it doesn't doesn't work in the same way. So I was showing that work really as a relic, like a, a part of our our heritage of technology. And that's the great thing that ideas have to keep on on, on moving. Uh, Carla, do you think I could come back because hopefully your reception will be now and again talk about we would uh, you were just about to talk about some individuals who were um, reacting online again in the same same way. Yeah, I think I was going to mention how um, the use of social media, live streaming technology, um, especially through platforms like TikTok and the like, um, have really helped to educate communities in the face of COVID and to bring people together around shared causes. So um, you mentioned dance. Of course, I, I... I'm trying to remember where it's from. I'm probably going to quote the wrong country. I apologize. I don't remember if it was from Vietnam or from somewhere else. Um, but there was a, a famous dance that got started on TikTok um, that was about social distancing. And it was meant to educate people about, you know, to wear a mask, bump the elbow instead of shaking and whatnot. Um, and then there are other movements that encourage people to donate to good causes. And so uh, as people gravitate around these new uh, technologies and new ways of building community, it can also actually uh, motivate dollars to flow into charities. Um, it can motivate governments to take action. And I think that's really the power of the art when we talk about the, what role they have in terms of leading change on, on a larger scale. Uh, Metin, we 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 had agreed earlier that as you are uh, the more all-rounded figure of our panel, that you were we were going to lead into uh, you were going to help us lead into our, our conclusion. But I think it would be useful. Uh, you run uh, an organisation called the Salon, which um, in a way is exactly what we're talking about, what people are trying to do online in a way, trying this cross fertilization when we're isolated. And from what I was saying at the beginning, we were very much talking about COVID is showing the fault lines. And you've obviously appreciated for that for some time by the way that with the salon, you were trying to... Um, bring everyone together. Would you tell us a little bit about why you created the salon and what it is? I, I'm afraid you have to unmute. Met, met, uh, that, Thank uh, you, Alistair, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. This salon was founded as a social enterprise to create and value, add value together with academic, cultural, and philanthropic partners. Through innovative collaborations, one of the verticals of the salon focuses on impact, which recently hosted a series of iTalks inviting impact leaders to share their impactful vision, stories, and action. An exciting initiative where inspirational stories of impactors are shared, and this is done in 60 seconds. The, their stories do matter, and this is a moderated Iran question. What does impact mean to you? It was amazing to see people from different walks of life coming together to share in a common vision. The impactors are so motivated together with their aligned intention and influence to be a force for good, appreciating generational and cultural diversity to exist in shared purpose, desire to continue unlocking potential. The Salon appreciates the heritage, the innovation, the succession, by fostering new friendships and contemplating new ideas, aspiring to build towards the shared vision of positive global impact. Our journey is defined through our evolution, patterns, and legacy. We shape our patterns by being at present, which has the presence of past and the future at the same time. Our second initiative is engaging leading artists from different disciplines and industries, such as designers, collectors, auctioners, legal, finance, creative industries, range of collectible products and art. The objective here looks at how each one of them 
embarks on their journey and creates lasting impressions. Lastly, artists are great at this. Imagine a mountain. Now, steadily, you are moving and seeing the lake all of a sudden. Perhaps it starts raining. Maybe a helicopter sound. It could be suddenly interrupted with the noise of anything that is living in the nature. Artists are great in one main thing that I believe, observing information on an ongoing basis, constantly interrupting it in its significance and gives meaning with their application by splashing a color or inventing composing a series of musical notes. They stay in the present much more to keep creating from the mass information in front of them through ongoing simplification and interaction with the changing circumstances. They grow emotionally, express authentically, and inspire with everlasting impressions. Some is true for heart surgeons, a pilot, an acupuncturist, a sports player, a teacher. So there is an artist in each one of us, which is ready to flourish with being more present in the moment through the increased awareness of self and others, consciously progressing as pioneers with passion, purpose, and performance. Thank you very much, uh, Majin. Which is actually, uh, Zuen, you saw um, a work that very much um, influenced you uh, recently, I be believe, by Spencer Tunick, which you thought had a relevance to the, the, uh, our topic. I uh, Would you like to describe, I think, all the uh, naked people were standing one, one meter apart from each other. Would, would you care to share your thoughts about the Spencer tunic that you saw? Do you want, you'll have to unmute, I'm afraid. Joellen? Joellen, you'll have to uh, unmute, sorry. No, you're still muted. We can't hear you. Sorry. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 uh, uh, yes. The work has attracted my um, attention. It uh, was the exhibition of uh, American artist Spencer Tonic in front of Alexandria Paris in North London. Uh, there was two hundred, more than 200 people naked and wearing masks stood uh, one meter away. Uh, I think it's very, very amazing because he want to say, or maybe um, the artist want to do that. This kind of this creation, the kind of liberation and the examination of human nature for himself and his participants. And what the artist wants to express is so many people together, they have a natural desire to connect. The desire is stronger than ever. Yes. So I, I think the work is very attract, very attract me. Yes. Thank you. N Neil, um, you, I, I, what we seem to be talking about is isolation and communication, etc. And I know you are working with another artist in Birmingham called Charles Sanderson. And um, he, he has always worked on large scale uh, installations. I mean, he's even lit up the whole of the Red Square in Moscow. Uh, but the, in lighting up, he's not, he's not just talking about, he's not just doing it for the decorative effect. He's talking it about the different systems that we use. And I think he's working with you uh, on a, a, an Id on a work called the Fountain of Knowledge, um, can you tell us a bit about how, that? And it's I think it also has a direct relevance to the university because it's using certain laser technology, which the university were pioneers in way 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 before. Uh, um, yes, uh, so um, I think this is really quite an exciting. Uh, 
or, or will be quite an exciting piece of work. Um, Ch- Charles uses uh, projectors and lasers um, to put images on onto surfaces, and, and a lot of those surfaces are external. They're, they're buildings, although sometimes he, he illustrates the in, in, a, in, a, in a structure of, of a building. Mostly, I, I think almost entirely, his works are temporary. Uh, they're up for a, a few weeks or, or a few months at, at most. Um, but I think this is going to be his first uh, permanent external work. So um, because there's a lot of technology involved, fingers crossed that it, that it actually works. Um, and what he's doing, just to explain to the, the audience, um, is that the, the campus at, at, at Aston is, is mostly pretty new. It's dated from the, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, but just hidden amongst the, all these modern buildings is this tiny little Victorian uh, water fountain, which was installed, I think, as a sort of public good so that people could go there and get uh, fresh water. And it's a beautiful little uh, fountain, slightly tucked away on the, on the campus. And Charles's idea is to project onto it uh, images which he has a, an artificial intelligence uh, bot searching for, um, which uh, relate to uh, mankind's uh, uh, quest for knowledge. And they will be all sorts of things, scientific knowledge, historical knowledge, uh, um, uh, literature, and, and, and so forth, ge- generated uh, artificially. And so this fountain, which once uh, gave, gave water to people, will now give knowledge to people. And, of course, on a university campus, that's a, that's a lovely thing. That's... Uh, um, why are you at university? It's to, it's to, it's to drink from the fountain of, of knowledge. And, and here we have exact, exactly that. So I think it will be very beautiful. And I think the, uh, students, um, uh, in particular will appreciate it. Um, we just have to make sure the technology actually works. So I've got my fingers crossed about that. Yes, absolutely. But I, I think I saw a work up on his, um, uh, internet recently which was quite amusing because he called it a, a non-public work because he lives up in um, Finland and he'd made a work in the woods just for himself as far as and calling a non, non-public commission so I, I hadn't seen that still a lovely it yeah. a communication and I thought that really brought it home you know because he's living it must be very isolated up in in Finland um, but um Metin, that talking about the salon, which uh, sounds absolutely intriguing, I wondered whether you had any sort of specific examples of people meeting each other that might not have met in normal circumstances mm-hmm. and how, how a good conversation or uh, something good had come, come, come about from, from. Of course, I think Alistair, that may be something that um, I'll start from the, the reflection brings realization and may bring transformation and resonance if we have the right tools in our toolbox. So from this thinking, we uh, organize a, a, a weekend workshop with leading uh, master students and we got them to come from uh, different disciplines, and uh, there was about 30 people over the weekend. They had the psychometric tests. They had all sorts of analysis to understand themselves better. And at the end, when we put the uh, two people, uh, a lady from Central St. Martins, which is an extremely creative student, and a London Business School master student, very disciplined and focusing on IRS, they didn't really like to be together at all until the end of the program. And they did their final speech and then they hugged each other and said that this was the best thing that ever happened to us because we now understand each other better than ever before. So I think understanding self and others is the way that we are going to evolve to deal with this pandemic and many more that may come, unfortunately. But we have gone through understanding self and others is the key that the salon can add value by bringing disciplines. But, but actually, Carla, I, I wonder whether... In your world, because you're in the connecting people's <laughs> world, whether you too have any in in these dire times, whether you have some uplifting story about connecting people um, through through Bangini. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have an advisor I work with in Toronto, actually. So other side of the country, well, different country even. Um, and I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. We reconnected when we first launched and he is a music venue owner. We talked about starting up this series of um, shows where we can highlight musicians. And what was really great is that he was able to connect with artists from around the country and around the world who had performed at his venue. And so the shows that he produced were this combination of live performance and just casual like reflections on the times that they had um, in the music industry, whether they were at performances or shows. And it, it was just this great, it, it, it enabled you to kind of step out of our confined uh, circumstance at home and travel with them into what it's like behind the stage or on tour. And um, it, it gave him a chance to reconnect with people he hadn't spoken to in a while. It gave them a chance to connect with their fans, um, certainly allowed us to meet people from all over the world that we wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, and so I think, it, you know, like everyone else has said, the um, flocking to the internet, to live stream events, to virtual meetings, um, really is a new paradigm in communication and community that we haven't seen before. And I, I think this is a shift, uh, a major shift for how the world interacts, how communities interact and what it means to relate with one another. Um, of course, there's no exchange for real human contact and we all miss that and I hope we'll be back to that soon. Um, but I think this shows us that more is possible and especially in the world of business with so many companies adopting a, a remote uh, work environment and realizing that it actually can be extremely productive. Um, it's wonderful because we've, we would never have so much data about how possible it is to work remotely collaboratively and be successful, right? It's, it's, it's a giant study. <laughs> um, and I think that's gonna transform how business is done. Um, we're, we're seeing it transform how politics is done, how governments work. Um, so it, it really is a, a landmark time in our history. And I think that we are just at the cusp of technological innovation. I think the um, this very immediate like circumstance that we're brought into, right? It, it, everything changed overnight. And as a result, technology and, and how we relate had to change overnight with it. And so the pace of innovation um, has really picked up and things are succeeding and failing, I think, faster than they normally would be forced to. And that's a good thing for progress. Great. Thank you, Carla. Uh, we've had a, a couple of um, questions from attendees just come in. Um, one is quite challenging, and I'm not sure that anyone's going to want to answer it, but we can try. Uh, it's uh, from Michael D Douglas, and he says, uh, I don't think the um, actor. Um, any examples of how the arts have helped generate greater self-awareness, as this is the base of increased emotional intelligence? Now, are there any volunteers to answer that? Oh, great. Great, Neil. Wonderful. Uh, well, actually, I've already sent a little note to Michael, uh, but um, it, I, I think that's the sort of main point of what we're doing uh, in Birmingham is to, is to try and uh, connect um, people who are doing a lot of um, work in, because Aston's an engineering, it's a science university, it's very much not about um, emotional intelligence, it's about uh, hard things, it's, it's about you know, lasers and uh, optics and um, uh, 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 electronics and so forth. Um, and uh, part of the part of the purpose of, of the art works is to get people to um, relate what they're doing in their everyday lives with the, uh, their emotions, with emotional intelligence, if, if you want to use uh, Michael's term. And um, one of the works we've installed uh, by uh, Marco Mertem, an another um, Estonian artist, uh, it is a, a large. It's a it's a, a sculpture uh, in in marble or granite actually, um, and it's a huge pile of books and it's standing on a plinth. And the plinth has an inscription on it, which is uh, worth the effect of uh, these are all the books that I I should have read, but I was doing something else instead. And it stands absolutely between the library and the students' union. So the students can't help but go past this. 
And at, at one level, um, this can be seen as a kind of scolding, uh, you know, you haven't done enough work. But that is not at all uh, what Marco um, uh, means by this. Uh, the, the background is that he himself is not a great reader, uh, but nonetheless buys quite a lot of books and puts them, you know, as we all do, by the side of by the side of his bed saying, well, I'm going to read those books, but actually never gets around to doing it. And what he's trying to say is, um, I, I've bought these books. Um, I've lied to myself. I, I, I said I was going to read them, but I, I know I'm not really going to do it. Um, how, how, if I'm at a university where I'm supposed to be investigating the truth of things, the reality of things, how can I get to the truth of things if I don't tell the truth to myself? If I lie to myself about what I'm going to do, how can I expect other people and, and the world around me um, to, to, to also be, be honest? And, and that's quite a fundamental thing if you're a student to, to realise that, that honesty really matters. Um, so I'm hoping, I, I know that I know that it has really affected the students and the faculty and, uh, and probably members of the public as well. Um, we've had a lot of amazing feedback from that. But also it's a fun thing. I mean, we get pictures of students at their graduation photograph next to it and uh, sitting on top of it and, and so on. Um, you know, it's humorous as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we can do that through art. Absolutely. Um, moving from emotional intelligence to artificial intelligence, um, it's interesting that Rax um, held, I thought Metem would be interested because I, I attended a conference at the Serpentine uh, gallery, exactly, uh, that racks were the curators of. And it was very interesting because they had the top academics around the world coming to talk about artificial intelligence. And yet the the artists saw artificial intelligence in a completely different way. And um, I, I think that's what we're trying to get to, isn't it? It's the... Um, um, the understanding of different, different. Uh, 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 or, or um, oh, because uh, we have got another specific question that is uh, uh, geared to um, Zhuan, uh, because it's about the Art Basel Hong Kong being cancelled and the, the question is saying have there been any benefits and I, I think what you were talking about about the increased um, online presence um, might be interesting do, do you see any benefits from these big art fairs being cancelled like uh, Art Basel Hong Kong yeah, yes I think it's it, it's benefits to cancel the uh, Art Basel in Hong Kong and uh, uh, Basel Switzerland. It's uh, necessary during this spe special period. But, but based on the digital art market and economy, the development of the art market will face great pressure at the present and even for a long time in the future. Uh, um, but uh, and we noticed that. Um, and therefore, the art market, the gallery operates, artists and workers are changing to meet the needs of society. And we noticed that at the beginning of the year, Art uh, Basel Hong Kong launched an online exhibition for the first time. Although the online services is not as good as expected, but they still have more than 215,000 visitors. Uh, I think in the period, special period, it's a very good result. And uh, I think it's benefit because it's a good explosion. For some art in industries, the online platform provides them with more opportunities to reach a wide audience and more possibility in business. Although, although online exhibition can never replace the offline exhibition, but the people are also happy to embarrass the change by technology. And I noticed, I find that uh, artists and gallery operates 
publish their work on Insta Instagram, the sponsor can go to the website to buy it through the link. And they are usually、uh, small works of art, such as photographs. It's spent up. I, I think it's a very interesting experiment. It can also provide more chance for artists and gallery operators. So I think it's a benefit, maybe to、uh, cancel the exhibition, such as、uh, Hong Brazil, Hong Kong, and Brazil through the. Yes. So, so, in a way, what you're saying is the the crisis has made people braver online. So they're prepared to go through certain barriers. So they'll spend more money online that they wouldn't before. They'll take more risks online and engage in different different ways that there was a barrier there before, and it's helped us get through that barrier, which actually links to the last question. Uh, I've just got,、um, which was addressed、uh, addressed to me. Actually, it was saying,、uh, "You quote Dominic Cummings about the artists、uh, seeing things first. Can you give、uh, any examples?" Well, we've talked of, of a few examples, but、um, I have got one more image on my screen that I will basically that I think. I mean, I think Timo Toots and Rax, or all, all these artists,、um, have have been showing this. But I'm showing you here a work that was made a long time ago by a Russian group of artists. And what I think this, to me, sort of typifies what happened to our response. With COVID, because this is made by the、um, collective action collections group at the tail end of the seventies.、Uh, all these artists you're seeing there were not officially artists in the Soviet system. They weren't allowed to be artists. They had other jobs, and the state didn't consider them artists.、Uh, so. They used to have meetings. Their only audience was each other, and in this work and a, a linked work, they went out and they made statements in miles away from anywhere. There's and usually on their banners, rather than images which they have here, they had sort of protests. But they were so inane that the state couldn't complain about them. So it was just bland, Mark, Mark, Mark. And I think what was interesting about this group of artists called Moscow Conceptualists is that they broke broke the line of of thinking. They、um, they made us think in a new way. I think we still haven't、um, we still haven't come back. Still haven't taken advantage of that that idea that you know we've got to engage in different ways. It's, it's about balance rather than the pure ideas of someone. It's a, the interaction between. The, so, if you were a third generation Soviet living in Russia, you weren't able to communicate in the in the way that you were free. So, you invented new ways of communication, and that. The human brain is amazing, and、um, I think that's a. But we don't always use it. Has anyone else got anything that they would like to say to put a good conclusion <clears throat> to this? I would like to add a few points. This. We need many more pioneering visionaries to mentor and enable young artists to reach their full potential. Like Leonardo da Vinci was discovered by his patron, or like Telsa could have a more illustrious legacy with the right mentor around him. Steve Jobs would have been more authentic, reflective at these times to transform us further with the enriching attitude, aptitude, and approach, and through shared values, vision, and voice. We also need to encourage interdisciplinary talent 
to interact, to cultivate creativity through hard to hard conversations and innovative interactions online, offline, cross culture while supporting, innovating and to improve the lives of people across geographies, economies and industries. These are not easy times. Corona brought me many issues under the magnifying glass. Hence, pioneers, entrepreneurs, politicians, business leaders, mm-hmm. academics, philanthropists are prioritizing innovation today as the key unlocking post-crisis growth, looking at the needs of people. Therefore, we are seeing the online education increasing rapidly, blockchain technologies, enabling banking the unbank. This is an important area. And the people are not having even, although they have a lot of telephones, they are not able to tap into banking and facilitate simple needs. This area is now getting a lot of uh, interest from investors and technologists. And uh, I I believe that we will be able to um, grow by giving, growing and glowing. Uh, Well, uh, thank you very much, um, Natan. But um, I see we've uh, been joined by our final finalist, uh, panelist, uh, Petra Beck. Very nice to see you. Good Um, morning. My my own uh, Scottish clan was famous for arriving at the last minute to win the battle. So we're going to leave you with the... um, concluding statement have you got anything that i know i love the name of your organization which is international art bridge isn't it um and i perhaps you would tell us why we need an art bridge to complete this panel I think nowadays it's more important to be connected to the art world and to the artists. Uh, in my mind, artists are trendsetters. They can see the future much more, much easier than we can do. In a way, they are trendsetters. They see changes in political way, in cultural ways. And um, there needs to be a way to be connected to these kind of trendsetters to learn, to get innovation, creativity, and um, yes, um, expe- especially in these uh, disruptive times, we need an approach to the art world. This is quite uh, important nowadays. This is why I called my company, International Art Bridge, um, to, to bond these um, different parts together, economy and the art world, because um, it's, it's quite difficult, especially in these days of separation, to get to connected to the art world. And this is what I um, yes yeah, doing now for the last 10 years to get these two groups together. I think that is a very good concluding message because I think that's what everyone has been speaking about is how we can try and um, get more connection between artists use their ideas more and um, it, I think it's, um, it's the way the future goes and if we have more organisations like Salon and International Art Bridges um, and uh, Bangini will, and Sculpture Parks in Aston and lots of women entrepreneurs will be fine. So thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All the best. Be safe. Be well.